So first of all, as I uh, mentioned to you, Laura is the general manager and chief medical officer of uh, Amazon Clinic. Um, he spent the last three and a half years working at the company in healthcare, specifically with the PillPack acquisition, Amazon Pharmacy. Um, he's done a variety of things globally, and I think these things are gonna show up in how he approaches his current uh, role in, in leadership. Um, let me give you some of the examples here. In 2009, he co-founded MetaCompass, which is an SMS-based service and algorithm allowing mothers in Cape Town to text their infant symptoms and receive detailed action steps to care. Um, in 2013, he led user experience and product design for the launch of uh, Gia Boso, which is one of the uh, leading mobile apps, finance mobile apps in uh, Brazil. Um, he then was the founding medical director of City Block Health. And City Block Health is a company that focuses on delivering health care to low income and elderly uh, Americans. He's published multiple research papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. He serves as a member of the White House Health Equity Roundtable and has been named one of the business leaders, business insiders 40 under 40 in healthcare. Um, he obtained his uh, MD from Harvard Medical School, his MBA from Harvard Business School, his AB with honors from Harvard College. He trained in internal medicine at Columbia University and is a board certified internist. So great background. And why don't you come up and we'll take a look at the video here. So when you think of when you think of Amazon and Amazon and healthcare, we really have three major pillars. So mm -hmm. the first is our, our pharmacy, which was born out of PillPack, Amazon Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And if you think of our goal and what we're trying to do across Amazon Health Services, mm -hmm. our goal is to make it as easy as possible for customers to find, choose, and afford the products and the services they need to get and stay healthy. So we're doing that across our three businesses in ways that fit with a lot of our uh, core skills and core talents. So Amazon Pharmacy, born out of our pill pack acquisition, you think of it as you have a, if you have the Amazon app right now, you have a full service pharmacy in your pocket. So what that means is you have access to the full spectrum of uh, medications. You can see transparent prices. If you're a Prime member, you have access to the Primer X card, which gives you discounts on medications at Amazon Pharmacy, as well as thousands of medications nationwide. And I think one of the things I'm really proud of with Primer X is that if you look, you'll see that we often have the lowest prices on medications, bar none. Um, we launched another program with Amazon Pharmacy called RX Pass, where for $5 a month, uh, customers can get um, access to over uh, 50 generic medications. So if that's one medication, $5 a month. If you're on 10 medications, it's still $5 a month for all your medications. So that's, that's pretty transformative pricing for folks, whether they're on one medication or 10. That's a, that's a pretty sort of transformative and new model for how to think about and price drugs. Um, but I think the thing that people really know Amazon Pharmacy for is, it is rather than you having to go to a pharmacy to get your medications, your pharmacy comes to you. So free delivery of medications at your doorstep in, you know, we used to say two days or less, one day, one day or less, but we actually recently announced that in College Station, we're now doing drone delivery, so in an hour or less in that area, you can get your medications delivered. So really trying to push the envelope on what it means to have both convenience, low prices, and affordability and transparency in pharmacy. So think of that pillar as Amazon Pharmacy, we're really trying to innovate on that space and make it easier and more convenient for folks to be adherent to their medications. Leans into our strength in Amazon of getting a product from point A to point B. It's a thing we've built some skill over over the last few years and applying that to what we do in pharmacy. Next vertical, Amazon Clinic, which is the business um, I lead. So another thing that Amazon's pretty good at is connecting buyers and sellers, connecting customers to the goods and services that they need. Really doing the same thing with Amazon Clinic in healthcare. So right now, again, if you have the Amazon app, which I'm assuming most people probably do, you can access telemedicine right there from that app. So no need for a different login, no need to you know, download a new app. If you need you know, birth control or hair loss medication, which you don't, you have a gray head of hair. Oh, thank um, you. You know, you know. It's you getting gray though. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't gonna yeah, comment. I wasn't yeah, gonna yeah, comment. You have something for that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, if you, if you need, um, you know, birth control, or let's say you're, you're coughing, you have COVID, you need a Paxlovid, um, it's, it's flu season. Maybe you need um, to be checked in for your, your flu symptoms. A range of up to you know, 35, 40 conditions right there on amazon.com. You can either have a message-based interaction with the doctor, 
or you can do a video connection with a doctor. So telemedicine right there in your pocket for the oftentimes uh, cheaper than what folks pay for their copay. So that's right there in your pocket at all times, nationwide access to telemedicine, because we know that more convenient care is more accessible care. And then our third pillar is One Medical. So based off an acquisition that we made uh, about a year ago, One Medical is, in a lot of ways, it's primary care as it should be across the nation. It's what you'd want for you know, your brother, your, gr your mother, your grandmother. Doctors who are dedicated and focused, um, convenient access, same day clinics. It's just, it's anyone who's ever been in one medical experience, it's, it's just really nice. Mm -hmm. And thinking about what does it look like if you know, primary care could be as pleasant as any other of the sort of major consumer experiences you have, that's really what One Medical leans into. And it's a, you know, it's a subscription-based program because what we're saying is that primary care should be a longitudinal relationship should go throughout. And when you think of us in Amazon, we are, we are fairly good at building kind of delightful and engaging subscription-based programs. I think Prime fits in that um, Prime fits in that category. So there's a lot of brand synteny between us and One Medical and saying, how can we bring that convenience and delight to healthcare as well? So I think of that as our three major pillars of our healthcare business, with Amazon Pharmacy being the organization I was a part of and was chief medical officer of that business, and now I'm leading our Amazon clinic business. So that's a, kind of a high level overview. Excellent. You did better than the video, by the way. Yes. I appreciate it. But there was, there was less cool music going on in the Yeah, back. okay. We'll eventually go, you want to sing too? You can do something. <laughs> um, so let me ask you, when you made the business case for this, all the, the healthcare, tell us what your, your proposition was. Because obviously Amazon can do a lot of things. This is costly. To, to make these acquisitions, et cetera. What was your kind of argument about making these investments? So, so, so for us, you know, we started with um, Amazon Pharmacy. So what he's, what he's referencing is I, so Amazon has a culture of uh, PRFAQs. So PRFAQ, we have a, a doc culture throughout the company where we, we write docs, we don't do PowerPoint. As someone who spent some time at McKinsey, I was, I was very sad that I could know, you know my, my blue arrow making skills were going, going to waste. <laughs> but um, it's very much a doc writing culture. So a PRFAQ, you write the press release for the new product that you're launching first. It helps orient everyone in a customer-facing sense. You're not, you know, the first page of your doc is not um, internal machinations, how hard is it for the tech team to build, what's, what's the UX, no, 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 you're oriented on what are you telling the customer, what's the customer experience, what's the press release out to the, out to the public. That's the first page of the doc. And after that, you have a bunch of FAQs. That can be everything from how will this make money, how many people will you need to, to build this, what does the UX look like, um, so PR FAQ. So I, I wrote the doc for what became the business for Amazon Clinic, and a big part of the so a lot of companies, a lot of initiatives within Amazon starters PR FAQs. Prime was a PR FAQ at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so in in making the case, you always work back from the customer and the customer need. So the first question everyone always asks is, do customers want this, and what evidence do you have that customers want this? So saying. Well, you know, I I, don't, I, was, I talked to my mom, and my mom really wants X, Y, Z. It's obviously not going to carry the day. So there's there's a mix of you needing to craft a narrative that makes sense with your leadership, because Amazon acts kind of like an internal VC. If you're going to get new funding to do new projects, you, you, you only really need one yes, but you have to find someone to say yes, to say, great, we're going to put... X amount of PL and headcount toward building this thing over this time period, and we're gonna hold you accountable to building it and reaching those outcomes. So for us, it was a narrative around here's the customer benefit, some data around the customer benefit, and I think some of the things you'd mentioned around the, the uptake of um, telemedicine and seeing that there was infrastructure we'd built already. So on um, through Amazon Pharmacy, we'd seen that we now had a lot of customers coming to Amazon for um, for medications. And part of my insight was that they're actually not coming for medications. They're coming for a solution to their problem. And that problem, the solution is sometimes a medication, but they're really coming for the problem. So what do we do to meet them at the problem stage? You know, did um, did some, had our UX team do some customer research, pulled some publicly available data and said, there's a real opportunity here, particularly around uh, telemedicine. This is something that's gonna continue to grow. We know customers like it. So once you can show that customer need, then you have to help people understand, okay, fine, the customer need is there. Why now and why us? What's unique about this moment that we should do this now versus do this you know, a month from now, a year from now, three years from now? What's, what's the platform that says we need to do this now? Is, there, mm -hmm. is the opportunity gonna go away? Are we are uniquely positioned for now? Like why now versus later? And then why, why us? 
you know, what, what makes this a unique situation in which we should be investing in this and we think we can add um, to the experience in a unique way. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few years ago, Michael Porter, who was at Harvard Business School, wrote a report about kind of the state of healthcare. And I think that the, the summary message on it is there wasn't competition down to kind of the, the provider level. Is it fair to say when you made this business case that really customers, or in this case patients, are not getting the transparency about selection? They're not getting transparency about quality ratings. They're not getting transparency about price. And that creates a lot of the business case here. Is it fair to say that? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that you know, markets can be a force for good. And I think oftentimes you'll see that when you're able to create a market, it lets, it lets customers choose based on their preferences. So if you take um, Amazon Clinic, some customers you know, they want a provider that's focused on women's health. They want a provider that's focused on men's health. Some want a provider that's going to get back to them in you know, 15 minutes, which we have some providers who their SLA is 15 minutes. So for some, you know, an hour is enough time, and I'd actually rather have the one who's going to cost less. But to us, having that selection and surfacing that out, because one, you know, having price transparency in general is unique in healthcare. Which is very, very unique. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go hop on a plane and then I'd say, okay, you're you're flying to San Francisco. I'll, I'll tell you how much it costs afterwards. But that that is the norm in healthcare. Um, so having the price transparency alone is uh, transformative. But to us, it's layering that with other choices lets people personalize based on what matters to them. Okay, excellent. And so basically, customers would have this broader choice. Tell us about you know you're running a platform. I assume healthcare providers on one side patients on the other. Is it fair to assume that the customer is the patient? I think for, for us, we, so we, we have a saying where we like to think of both as our, as our customer, but uh, so we, we have these things called tenants. And the idea of, of a tenant is um, there are things that help you make um, decisions. There are the things that help your team make decisions when you're not in the room. So they should help sort of tie break. So one of, one of the tenants is that to us, both providers and customers are our uh, customers and patients are our customers, but if you have to choose between the two, you always choose the the end customer, the patient, mm -hmm. and that you know, that dynamic is a that tenant is pretty um, universal in a lot of Amazon businesses. Where mm -hmm. if you have to choose, you you optimize for your end customer, but you realize that you do have you know, multiple customers, multiple stakeholders who you want to make sure have a good experience. So is it fair to say that the healthcare provider they would probably attack me in a dark, but they're the seller in essence on the platform. They're the provider, and what is going to happen? here, and I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but in terms of the chess game, the transparency about the providers or the sellers is going to be much greater, and there's going to be an incentive to make sure that what they're providing is meeting the need of the patient, and that may mean availability, so when can somebody be seen, et cetera. It can be cost, and it could be quality. Is it fair to kind of say it is analogous? I, I, think, I think that's right, and I think in a, in a lot of ways, you know, that's actually, that, that's aligned with what the provider groups want. For us, you know, we think a lot of the provider groups, they do want to provide high quality, convenient, and affordable care. So us being able to make that transparent is aligned with what they want to do as well. Okay, excellent, excellent. By the way, where does all this play out long term? Will you eventually use technology in the diagnostic area? You know, I think about Amazon having a recommendation engine. It's looking at what we've done, what we've bought, what's available, and making pretty good recommendations. Is there a model that diagnostics will kind of become part of the the solution here? So I think you know Amazon's a, a technology company. I think they've developed great technology. People, people say Amazon is, and to some people, Amazon is a logistics company. To some people, Amazon is a technology company. To some people, Amazon is a movie company. I think that's one of our huge strengths is that we're able to we're able to know what we do well and do it, but we're not myopic about what we do well to the point where we can't expand our um, skill set. And I think that's that's super, super important for us. So mm -hmm. continuing to develop technology that lets other people do what they do well is really important to us. But we, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about you know, 3P and, and 1P. So 1P being things that we um, own and operate ourselves, like our pharmacy we call a, a 1P business. Mm -hmm. Clinic is a 3P business where 
our job is really to be the platform and enable the third parties, the provider groups, to do what they do better, being providing great clinical care and connecting them to customers who they who can benefit from that great clinical care. Mm -hmm. To us, we're going to use technology to hopefully make it easier for people to do both. So to both make it easier for our 1P services, like our pharmacy, to deliver efficient and delightful care. And we're going to use technology to make it easier for the third parties to do the same for them to deliver efficient and optimal care. And I think that's, look at our retail business, 60% of what we sell on retail is by, done by third parties. But the technology stack in retail helps the first parties and the third parties do that more efficiently than either of them would by themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you looked at this opportunity to improve transparency for patients and healthcare providers, I would assume it is a massive opportunity. So if I think about the, the healthcare I've experienced and say, what percent of the time did I have transparency about availability, about price, about ratings? It was probably 1% of the time. It was almost zero. So do you look at this as a, a complete uh, change? This isn't taking something from 80% transparency to 85. This is zero to what could be 100%. Is that fair to say? And I think that's, that's, that's what excites us, is thinking where, where are areas where if we do things differently, it can make a huge difference for the individual, but also hopefully can um, show, in, show the industry that there's, there's a new way to do some of these things. I recently read a story about a Volvo, actually, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize this, but Volvo were the creators of the three-point seatbelt. And when they created the, the three-point seatbelt, right, that became a trend throughout the industry, and that was something that they promoted, saying, hey, this works better, this is safer, please do that across. I think in a, in a lot of ways, when it comes to things like you know, transparency, we're, we're hoping that this is a three-point seatbelt moment where as, mm -hmm. we, as we're having more, tr we show that transparency is actually better for everyone, better for the providers, better for the customers, mm -hmm. that other people will want to do the same and help make healthcare more transparent and more accessible. Yeah, so transparency for providers, I assume it's a tale of two stories. So the people that are good will get more business and people be aware. It's a, those that are not, either that are expensive, that are not available, that get rated in whatever way, they will be harmed if they don't improve performance. Is that kind of how it plays out? I think I think it's all all about how you think about you know strategy. So I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've you've taught this to your students lots of times. Those strategy matrix where you know it's it's not just a line on the right, right? Some things are on the right, then you zig to the left, and other things are to the right, and that's that is the strategy. Part of strategy is we're going to be exceptional on this and we're not going to lean as much in, into that and i think that's that's part of what we're hoping providers get to do there's maybe some providers who are saying you know what we're going to lean into being faster and we're going to do that and that's great there may be some providers who will say we're okay with not being as fast because we're going to be more affordable and what we're actually hoping is that folks will be able to lean into whatever their strategy is as a provider group because that will let them serve different subsets of customers and patients. Not mm -hmm. all patients are the same, so therefore not all provider groups should be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Let me shift gears a bit, because your background is fascinating. You, you've worked a lot on healthcare equity. Matter of fact, that's been a bigger part of your early days than anything else. How did that inform your view about Amazon Health, about Amazon Clinic, et cetera? So, so, so for me, um, one of the things that really excited me about Amazon is just the, the scale of the organization. So truly an opportunity to have an effect at scale. I think I've been able to work with, and as a part of a lot of great organizations, a lot of them were, were startups. So it's, it's really exciting to take a startup and be able to take something that's hopefully doing something really good on a small scale and work to scale that. But here I'm coming in with something that's already operating at scale and trying to say, okay, how do we, you know, how can I use the resources we have at scale at Amazon on problems I think are really, really important. And I think that's that's the problem I'm tackling at kind of this this stage. I I think and have always thought healthcare is a super important problem. So how do we use the resources of, it, of Amazon and apply them to that problem space? Yep. So um, if we were to look at where the benefit is, and obviously this this uh, conference is on tech and society, and how can tech be used for good, and then what are the things that can go wrong? Because there's obviously a lot of concerns with a variety of tech companies about not helping society. If you, if I were to ask you to rate the benefits of the, a lot of the things that you're going to offer, number one, accessibility in terms of place. Somebody doesn't need to go into a city or take work off. They can do a telehealth. Scale of 1 to 10, 10 being this is going to completely improve 
uh, uh, outcomes for, for individuals. Where would that one rate? Yeah, so, so accessibility is so important. I think it's not just place in terms of you not having to go in. We know in the US there are healthcare deserts, there are pharmacy deserts. So we, we know that there are so many pharmacy deserts in the US. So therefore, being able to say, regardless of what your location is, urban, rural, suburban, you have access to a pharmacy. You can call a pharmacist 24-7 and have them pick up. You can get meds delivered to you. It, you know, it equalizes the field in the sense that if you can have accessible delivery nationwide, then you know, you're helping reduce that lack of access, particularly around issues like pharmacy deserts. So I, mm -hmm. I think accessibility is super important. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I don't want to just say mm -hmm. ten, tens across the board because um, I think mm -hmm. that makes it less, less exciting. But I, th I do think I do think being able to have that locate, having being able to have easy accessibility matters a lot. Yep. It's, not, it's not accessibility for everything as we build things. With I think Amazon Clinic, you know, we're not we're not solving um, the lack of accessibility for cancer care or hospice care, right? There are a lot of parts of healthcare that we're not doing right now. So therefore, we are by no means solving all problems. I was yeah, my my company CityBlock served a lot of um, homeless patients, patients with severe mental illness. That's a population that has severe severe need. That you know, on Amazon Clinic right now. We're not, you know, we're not serving uh, schizophrenia. We're not serving what we call SMI, so severe mental illness. So there, there are there are gaps there. But I think accessibility within the space that we are operating in, I think yep. that's that's super super important. What about cost? Scale of one to ten, will prices come down? Cost of healthcare? That's I think that's that's really what Amazon has shown that they're they're good at. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon's shown that we're. Because we take such a long-term view, we're we're able to think a lot about how do we make sure that we can remove affordability, at least we can help reduce affordability as a barrier for healthcare. Because we know that um, a, a third of customers don't take the medications they're prescribed, and one of the major barriers there is accessibility. So knowing that we can have low-cost um, both healthcare and pharmacy services, we think will go a long way in making healthcare more accessible and affordable. Okay, what about people that don't have broadband access, digital devices, the things that we saw during COVID? Um, thoughts about how that gets addressed? Yeah, I think the, the digital divide is is a major, mm -hmm. major issue, especially as a, as a tech company who's delivering care virtually. If you don't have access, these services are not going to help you. And I think that's that, that's a problem and something we actually think about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Amazon Clinic, one of the ways that we were thinking about designing that is we thought about that population a lot. And it's part of why we really wanted to make sure that we launched message-based service. Because what we said is if you have no access, mm -hmm. and that's going to be really hard. But there are folks who, like you're saying, they don't have access to broadband, mm -hmm. but they do have access to lower bandwidth options. And with, some, with asynchronous care, that then means even if your service is either low bandwidth or it's choppy, so it's going in and out, you can still access that care. You can still get that back and forth. So there are ways in which... You know, we talk a lot about um, accessibility and access within our company, and for us, you know, accessibility means both the way that people typically think of dis, um, accessibility. So making sure you have screen readers, um, you know, making sure you have ASL. But I, we also think a lot about accessibility in terms of um, broadband accessibility and thinking about what does that mean for customers who have access, who have low bandwidth access. Yep. Give us these are really helpful because you know we talk about guardrails and we also talk about product definition to ensure that tech doesn't hurt. Society. You, met, you mentioned message-based services. Other things that tech companies can do to ensure there's broad access of services. Yeah, I, th I think it's so. I think I think part of it is you have to design design with those customers in mind. So it's to me, it really does. You know, if you're only thinking about access after you've launched, like that's that's a problem. You have to have it there at the the BRD stage when you're first conceptualizing the services. You should be thinking about. What customer segments is this going to appeal to or not? And what are those barriers? And then that's the stage at which you start thinking about how you're designing for it. With it, with Amazon Pharmacy, we said, look, we want to have broad insurance coverage because we know that the majority of customers pay for most of healthcare with their insurance. But we also stopped to say, okay, the majority do, but not all do. And there are, there are large and important populations who don't have insurance. You know, the, the ACA reduced the number of uninsured, mm -hmm. but it didn't put it to zero. We still have a lot of people in America who are uninsured or underinsured. So what are we doing for that population? And that's that's part of what was the push to say, when we launch, we need to launch with something for that population. And that's how we thought of PrimerX. That way, even if customers don't have insurance, they still have access to low cost, um, low cost medications that are sometimes going to be cheaper than their insurance. We see that a lot of times 
folks will see for certain medications, it's cheaper to use their Primarex discount than it is to use their insurance. And that's then creating an innovation that is amazing actually for everyone. It started as a thing that you're saying, mm -hmm. how can we make sure that we're serving the underinsured and those who are uninsured? But then you say, here's something that actually everyone can benefit from. Yep, excellent, makes sense. By the way, we're gonna go to questions in a minute. So slido.com, Easton one, the number one, um, and I'll start taking uh, questions in, uh, in just a second. So um, the primary offerings you're talking about here are general medicine. Yep. Right? Is that kind of 90% of the problem and just focus on that or really this should start moving up market, dermatology or a variety of other areas? Yeah, I mean, health, healthcare, is, healthcare is really broad. There are a lot of, of needs. So to, you know, it's hard to say what's 90% of the problem because healthcare is so personalized. You know, to, to someone who has cancer, cancer is 100% of the problem. Right? To someone who has heart failure, heart failure is 100% of the problem. So it's, it all, it's so individualized that it's, it's hard to say. I think, I think this is the place that we've, we've decided to start and we think it's an important problem to solve. Mm -hmm. But again, healthcare, healthcare is broad and there are a lot of needs. It's part of why, to us, we, we say, um, it's actually, I, 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 quote, I have an uncle who I, who I quote a lot. And he's got, he's got this, this saying that he uses where he's like, if you, if you wanna go slow, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you go you go together. It's you know my Nigerian uncle. He's he's very wise. But um, I've been saying it around the, the company a lot. And I think we as a company in the in the healthcare organization, we we get that there are a lot of problems in healthcare, and we're not we're not going to solve them alone. That's why partnership has been such a key part of our strategy going forward. Excellent. Good. Good. Again, reminder: Slido.com. I'm going to take some of the questions in just uh, just a second. Say more about artificial intelligence in the use here. Um, is it going to really improve diagnostics? How will it do it? What type of medicine? And how will it compare to what Google is trying to do uh, directly for providers? I think one, AI, AI is an amazing tool. Like all of technology, it's an amazing tool. But we, we do have to remember that technology is, it is a tool. So tools are very helpful. You know, if you've ever tried to build IKEA furniture with no Allen wrench, you will know. Tools are very, very helpful. So, you know, it's, it's super important. We're, we are a technology company, but the tools are helpful, but the tools have to fit with the workflows and fit with the users, right? So you have to, you have to look at it as that full spectrum. You can't just focus on one element, particularly in, in healthcare. Now, that being said, for, for us, you know, we as Amazon have been using AI for a very long time. We as Amazon Healthcare, we use AI in a, in a variety of ways. When you, when you go on Amazon.com, uh, you know, some, some of the pricing you'll see um, that price transparency, it's, it's AI that helps us understand and analyze various data sets to let you know what that price is going to be. So I think there are a lot of frameworks to think about how you use AI. Mm -hmm. One I use a lot mm -hmm. is one thinking about you know, safety. So you know, the in sa safety meeting is actually even more important in healthcare than it is, I think, in a lot of other industries. So you have to think about what is the use case that I'm trying to use this, this tool for and what level of kind of accuracy and safety do you need? So is this, is this something where, you know, it's okay to be 90%? Do you need to be 95%? Do you need to be 100%? If you're, if you're using your AI tool to help your customer service agent answer a question correctly, Right. You don't have to be 100%. If you're using your AI in some customer-facing, direct customer-patient interaction way, you probably do need to be closer to 100. But mm -hmm. that's, that's going to vary a lot on the use case and the safety. So whether or not the AI can do harm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to inform how much autonomy you give the AI and you know, making decisions, how many humans need to check that work afterwards. I think that's, that's really important. Mm -hmm. you know, equity and accessibility, we, we think a lot about. So you know, if you're using this tool, what is, what is that alternative? And how is, it, how is that alternative going to be applied kind of broadly and across the board? Mm -hmm. and, then, you know, and then third being the actual operationalization. So how does, how does that fit in, how does this tool fit into the existing workflow or change the workflow? So do you know, does this, is this the workflow goes from A to A plus one, or are you going to sort of revamp the workflow completely? So understanding that, understanding how the tool is going to be used as you're rolling out the tool is also super important. Okay. But, but you know, to, to answer your macro question, I think, I honestly think the opportunities for AI in healthcare particularly are, are huge. And healthcare is so broad, so there are so many parts of um, healthcare that can be applied in, but I, I think we're gonna see a lot of good come of AI, especially if we can do it and use it responsibly. And that's, that's gonna be key, responsible AI can do a lot of good in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you now a separate topic about adoption, and especially adoption of prov uh, with providers. Mm 
Not, not patients. I assume patients, most people are using Amazon. You may have some people that have not used it, but overall it's fairly intuitive. On the, on the provider side, a physician, and you're a physician, how do you think about getting physicians excited about participating on the platform and then ultimately um, using the data that drives diagnostic outcomes that are superior? Yeah, so so for us, I think we've been it's it's been awesome. I think there are so many providers who really want to be able to provide um, amazing care and connect more and more with customers. You know, providers, you you go into healthcare because you want to help people, and providers feel the um, providers feel the difficulties of the healthcare system as acutely as anyone else, and they they want to. They want it to be better and they want to be change agents in making it better. So I think a lot of providers see us as an avenue by which we can empower them to help make and make the changes that they want to see in the healthcare industry. And I think we as a company have taken a listening ear to say, you know, we're not, we're not here to come down from on high with answers, right? We're here to listen and co-collaborate and co-create solutions. And I think that's that's part of why we've seen such great engagement from across the healthcare industry. So we've had you know, lots of providers reaching out, wanting to engage in our existing services even more, um, to the point where we're working on figuring out better processes so that we can engage them more rapidly. We've seen, as, as you mentioned, payers. You know, Blue Cross Blue Shield of California is one example, but there are many payers who are already collaborating with us and wanting to collaborate more with us. We've seen you know, manufacturers wanting to work with our pharmacy. So it's just, I think there are, there are so many players who want to work with us, and I think that's because so many folks in the healthcare industry want to make it better. And I think we are taking a stance of want saying, we're here to listen and co-create and collaborate to yeah. make this industry better for patients and customers. When you do your segmentation, going back to your own MBA, and you think about you know, uh, healthcare providers, I, I'm sure they're not all the same. I still remember my physician when Epic got implemented. I never, he seemed like a very nice guy. He was like in an altered state, pissed off, everything. <laughs> How is this not different? When they have to kind of deal with a different you know, uh, platform and all, is this actually people that are kind of digital natives that are physicians that say this is all cool and there's a bunch of people hate it or no, it's actually better than you think? Yeah, so I, I think I think it so it depends on what, what what we mean for for this. I think for for us with clinic, one the the first practices that we've brought on are practices that all have experience with um, telehealth. So it's not it's you know there are there are practices who you know they're they're more um, analog you know paper and uh, paper and pen, I think those mm -hmm. are more the exception than the norm these days. There are some who have done a lot of telemedicine, so they're used to it. You know, they they know their website manner, as as we often say. And there are some for whom telemedicine is new, and there's a, there's a spectrum there. I would definitely say we've we've worked first with the folks who are more familiar with um, telemedicine. Mm -hmm. But I but I think honestly, when you think of there are also some design components we've we've taken that makes it easier for folks to hop on board. So for the provider groups who are on Amazon Clinic, they all work in their own EHRs, for example. Mm -hmm. So they're not having to switch to a completely new tech stack within their organization. We've done the work on our side to make that integration and sort of surface those APIs so it's easier. And that's that's an example of thinking about how your tooling fits with the workflows. We could have taken the stance to say, you know what, if you want to work with us, great, you need to use all of our tooling and switch over. But instead, we said it's important that we make sure that you know, we want to have the right front end and the right experience for customers, but we also want to make sure that the back end and the tech stack and the experience for the providers matters as well and isn't a huge change. So that's, it's really important, again, to think about how the tool fits with the existing workflow and fits for the person using the tool. Mm -hmm. Excellent, let me ask you a final question before we do the audience Q&A, and that's broadly about leadership. Tell us about how you think about leadership, how it's informed your work, and I mean to the audience here who are existing leaders and rising leaders, what is your advice to them? Well, I, I think I'm I'm still on on my leadership journey, so therefore I'm not you know I'm not going to give I'm not going to give a, a ton of advice, but I'll give you some some thoughts on how I think about it. And again, there's there's no there's no right answer to to go back to um, something my mother told me oh, a long time ago, which yes. we were talking about is you know we should all kind of be like be like a sieve. Right, where at the at the end of the day, you know, our your, your goal is you're going to get a lot of advice through your career, and you're going to see a lot of models. Some of those models are going to be amazing and good, and you should keep those. 
right? And some of those, there you're going to have people who are going to show you exactly what you shouldn't do, right? Like no matter what you do, you're going to see both, and those you have to let settle through. And the, your you know, our job as leaders is to be able to sift out the difference between those. Take the good examples and amplify and learn from those, but also know the bad examples and let those go away. Because it can be very easy to fall into the trap of leading the way that the person above you always leads, and you don't, you don't want to do that. Because a good part of your goal as a leader is to do things differently and do things better. Right? If you're not doing things better than the people who you learn from, then you're, you know, you're, 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 really, you're failing as a leader. So that's, that should be your goal. And that can, that can mean a lot of things. Right? In, a, in, in a microcosm, I think, I think of a lot of the roles I try to take on as leader. Um, there are multiple archetypes. There's you know, leader as teacher and coach. That's, that's super, super important to not just say, we're doing seven, we're doing four, we're going left, we're going right. That's the strategy. You'll be able to engage with your team and say, OK, here's what we're thinking about. We're, taking, we're going to take this path, and here's why we're going to take that path. Right? You're, you're coaching, you're leading, you're teaching, and you're making the people on your team better. Your, your job is to be much more Phil Jackson than it is to be Michael Jordan. And I think people often, people often can forget that because sometimes you get to your leadership role because you were Michael Jordan for so long. So I think that, that's important is that archetype is leader as teacher, leader as umbrella is also really, really important. So a big part of your role as the team is to just, you know, protect them from the rain. There's going to be, a, there's often a lot of swirl at companies, organizations, there's this, there's that, there's change. And a lot of times all you need to do is provide the cover for your org. That way they're not getting churned. They're not being disrupted by you know, all of these things, all these things happening and going. So I think being able to be the umbrella and, you know, protect your team so that they can get what they need to get done done is super, super important. And I think the, the third archetype, and again, you know, these are not all of them. These are just a, a subset that I think I, I name because not everyone thinks about them, is you know, leader as a therapist. Right? And part of that is being able to actually understand the people on your team, understand what they're going through, because you know, the better they are able to function, right, they are, you know, you, you're not going to get much done. You know, the, the leader is often not the smartest person in the room. If the team is right, they're the dumbest person in the room, and they're least able to get things done. You know, I, I, I have a tech team. I, if, I'm, if I'm writing our lines of code, we're in, we're in trouble, right? So therefore, a big part of my goal is to make sure that you know, I understand them, I understand their needs, so that I can you know, align them, unblock them, and really unlock their capability. So I think it's important to think about your archetypes for leadership and be deliberate in your practice of leadership around making sure you're learning and getting better and learning from the good and also learning from the bad. And learning from the bad doesn't mean emulating the bad. Learning from the bad means being able to say, that's not good. I don't want to be that. So therefore, I need to know how to do the opposite of that. Yeah. Well, so by the way, there's a great YouTube clip from Wara's graduation from Harvard Medical School in 2015, where he talks about his mom and talks, he originally uh, criticizes her use of the word sieve. I, I was not criticizing my mom. He okay? I was. I was. I just want to yeah, give him the story. Give him the story. This man, this man is trying to end my life. Yes. Do you see him? Do you see him? <laughs> what I'm missing? <laughs> I was. I was using it as a as a um, critical example to show you know you know the the end result of the narrative was that she was right the whole time and I didn't understand her <laughs> rightness until the end. I became enlightened over the course. <laughs> he didn't talk to his mom for six months after graduation, <laughs> but after that was okay. <laughs> it was a great it was a great commencement by the way. So we got a whole bunch of questions. Let me uh, let me start uh, asking you the uh, questions. First one most popular question how will Amazon handle the liability of medicine of medical quality incorrect medicine medications, et cetera, that comes while delivering healthcare to such a large population. So I think it's I think it's super, super important. You know, if you're if you're gonna be in a space like healthcare that's so important, there are high responsibilities that come with there. It's you know, it's the it's the it's the Ben Parker theorem, right? With great power comes great responsibility. So we're we're already we're already in that space. We are we are delivering care day in and day out and we have a large we have large teams focused on uh, quality and safety in our pharmacy, in Amazon Clinic, and in uh, One Medical, and it's 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 important. It's an important role. If you're going to be in the delivery of care, then quality and safety is a key portion of what you do, and you have to design for it. There are you know, entire sort of training courses and expertise and degrees in quality and safety, and you you build the processes and you bring in the right experts to deliver be able to deliver care in a safe. Um, safe and high quality way. Mm -hmm. Good. Next question: um, Are is Amazon Health and Amazon Clinic profitable? Uh, 
If not, when do you expect them to be? You're probably going to tell us you'd have to kill us if you answered it. <laughs> well, any, uh, well, well, so, so what, what, I, what, I, what I'd say is that I'm, I'm doing this for you guys because we're a publicly traded company. So mm. if you want information on things like uh, profitability, I recommend pulling up some of our S1s. I think we actually, I think we, ju yeah, we just had our earnings report yesterday. So that's, that, that's the best place to see the information that you can get publicly on finances. Okay. <laughs> Very smooth. <laughs> you, you didn't get a law degree also when you were... Uh... <laughs> My wife is a lawyer, so I would say okay, I, got okay. the, I got the home law degree. She trained you well, <laughs> yes. Good, good. Uh, next one. Some healthcare providers and insurance companies might see joining Amazon Clinic as something that would decrease their revenue. How would you uh, refute that? I would, I would say it's, it's the opposite. I think, I think companies, companies are joining and partnering with us because... They one, you know, Amazon has a reputation for you know operational excellence and for being able to deliver amazing and engaging customer experiences. And a lot of stakeholders throughout the healthcare system want that. So I think they're engaging with us because they know that we can create those great experiences for their customers and they want that. But a lot of these companies are also businesses and they're also partnering with us because they see that it'll likely be you know accretive for their bottom lines. Okay. Excellent. By the way, what happens to insurance carriers over time? In like a Mac, you got you got to ask you got to ask Bernie Sanders and some some experts on that. I yeah yeah. You know, what, what I'll say is we are you know we're, we're partnering with lots of insurers because we think there's there's a lot of value that they that they add across the system. You know I'm you know I have I'm insured by a healthcare insurer. Right. You probably are. Lots of people are in this room. They they play a key role in the system, and you know, we're happy to kind of work together with any and all parties yep. who are focused on creating a better experience for customers. Can I give you my theory on this? You don't have to answer it. So uh, basically, you get a, uh, Amazon's going to do the AWS play. They used to have their own data centers. They said, hey, we can manage this well, low cost. We're then going to make it available broadly. Amazon has a million and a half employees or more. Um, they're able to manage their own health costs well. They figure out that as time progresses, and then they become an insurance carrier in essence because they've got an ability to execute better. That would have been my theory over time. Interesting. That's an in interesting idea. Uh, it's less less interesting to me, but interesting idea. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't leave. <laughs> okay, good. Let me ask you a couple other ones here, and then we'll do a, uh, a wrap-up. Um, how will you uh, provide transparency of cost when health insurance companies may push back against us? Yeah, so part, part of it is, again, there's, there's that tenant we have where it's, you know, you have multiple customers, but the end customers are primary customers. So therefore, you know, as you're having these, these internal debates, that's where tenants really come in handy because the team can say, okay, well, you know, do, we, do we think this is beneficial for our end customer? And if the answer is yes, then you, you can start to design for it. And, you know, we're, we're lucky where there are you know, lots of sort of data sources that can help you um, provide that information. And by, by the way, there are a lot of uh, payers who actually are, have provided APIs to help us um, surface the price of some of those medications out up front. That way customers can see their pricing beforehand. So they're, they're actually mm -hmm. supporting us in that journey of making things more transparent. And where you know, you're not getting the same level of engagement, then you know, your tech teams are more creative in, un in understanding what are the data sources to help make that available. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you, you focus on your North Star, mm -hmm. which is the customer, and you, you design for them and you move forward. And you find if you have partners who want to help you move in that direction, you work with them. And where you don't, that's where you need to innovate and figure out other paths to get to the right design for the customer. Yep. Another uh, question is on mental health uh, services. Loneliness is the new epidemic of the U.S. described by the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General. How does Amazon help address mental health issues? How do you look at that service provision going forward? Yeah, so so one, one, one Medical actually has a lot of really amazing and really engaging um, mental health providers and services. So both ones that they employ without and also teams and organizations that they partner with. So mental health is sort of a large pillar um, there. And same with Amazon Pharmacy. We mm -hmm. you know, prescribe and provide great access and great affordability to a lot of mental health medications. Mm -hmm. But I think the other aspect of the, that question I think is really important is that there's also a lot that goes into mental health that is outside of the uh, for you know, the four walls of the healthcare industry, and that we we shouldn't forget those either. Something like you know, loneliness, engagement with with community, mm -hmm. those are those are things that occur and that need to happen for us to get where we are. A lot of you mm -hmm. know, a lot of health, the majority of health is not healthcare, and it's important to remember and keep that in mind as you're trying to move the needle on health. That it's going to be a lot more than healthcare. 
Do you see intelligent chatbots for mental health? You know, this, the application Pi now that can kind of have a conversation with you about how you're feeling, et cetera. A lot of younger people are polling saying they'd rather talk to a machine than a, a therapist, et cetera. Do you see that happening in the next few years? Yeah, so one, one of my favorite Nietzsche quotes is, you want to be stubborn in the purpose, but not in the path. Uh -huh. So so to me, we need to understand, okay, what's what's our goal? What's our purpose? If our purpose is addressing issues like loneliness, addressing our mental health burden, then we need to focus there, right? Our, fo our focus should be on that purpose, and we should be flexible in the path. So we should understand and be open to various tools, um, services, care models, non-care models that can get us there. So if that means that we think, you know, we think it's the you know, providers only and that is who delivers the best mental health care, great. If it's a family member who we find delivers the best health, mental health care, lean in there. Stubborn in the purpose, not in the path. Great. Listen, let me do this. I always like to finish any, any of the sessions that I moderate sharing my so what's. And I'm going to share them with you and you can, all the students are groaning here, the ones that have, have gone through all this, because I expect them to be able to do the same thing. You know, what I could do is cold call one of them. See, that's that's, them that's, the, that's the move. That would be really cruel, but I won't do that. Right, Asia? I won't I, do I, that. I'll cold call <laughs> you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so I'll share mine and they'll just go, yeah, yeah, those sounded really good. <laughs> okay, so I got five or six takeaways here. Uh, so what's here? Also, very very impressive to both actively moderate the entire time and have takeaways. Like, that is, that is a skill. <laughs> My short-term memory is not good, so I've written them down uh, here. So first of all, as you kind of look at this opportunity in Amazon and healthcare and clinic, et cetera, you basically had to satisfy yourself that technology enablers were there the availability of video, data, having a platform, et cetera, and that ultimately customers were gonna adopt. But you kind of went through an exercise, kind of courtesy of the Amazon way to say, what is the opportunity and how likely is it that you're gonna be able to, to win in, uh, in that area? Um, second main takeaway I got, the number of times you referenced Amazon as a technology company, I thought was very interesting. Um, deep tech is kind of how I read it. Not just a platform, not just managing costs and supply chain, but actually deep tech. And so I found that to be a, a, a kind of a helpful reminder. Number three, the opportunity for transparency. Transparency of availability, transparency of cost, transparency of quality. And we're potentially at most patients have 0%, maybe it's one or two, and the opportunities to get to 100% a la what we experienced today with, uh, with Amazon. Fourth uh, takeaway, um, the societal piece. How to ensure society is not harmed. At a base level, you basically talked about, again, better transparency, price, et cetera, but you talked about product design and guardrails. And specifically, you talked about um, new products like message-based service for people that may not have a, a fancy iPhone or a certain type of internet access. You talked about um, broad insurance coverage and options when people don't have insurance. It's part of your service uh, offering. Um, and you've talked about outcomes, thinking ahead about what outcome are you trying to achieve and testing whether that's occurring or not to see if people are being left out or not. But you have a set of activities there that allow you to both drive growth, but also make sure you're not harming society uh, along the way. Those are the takeaways that I got. Upgrades you have on that or uh, final messages? I think, I think those, are, those are great. Um, <laughs> I think, I think I would, I would just, I'd, add, I'd add in, I think, the, the leadership piece. Because I, I just think that's, that's, so, that's so important. The, you know, the way in which you, you get to different places and both in terms of solutions and in terms of the problem you're solving is, is the people. You know, what, what we work on and what problems matter, what customers matter, what questions we ask comes from the people around the room and around the table. So I just I think that's that's super important is thinking about how you lead and what problems you work on and who you work on them with. And hopefully yeah, we, we, we talked uh, before around making sure that people are following your energy. I think that's, that's, that's an important thing to think about as well as you're choosing what you work on. And I think a thing, a thing I'll, I'll note is, you know, there's a member, a member of my team, Sophie, wait, wave Sophie. So Sophie, Sophie was actually a, a student of Terry's uh, back in the day, but is um, on, our, on our finance team. And I think one of the things I really love about the way that she approaches problems is, you know, people talk a lot about you know being being a T, right? She's very very deep when it comes to her financial analysis. She's a trusted expert with it throughout the team, but she uses that expertise and the trust built there to really be a be a T and work across verticals. So that you know, because she's 
built that sort of deep expertise, but she also has broad knowledge, which I think honestly is something that the MBA training does really well. It makes you an expert on nothing. <laughs> Say that as an MBA. <laughs> but it makes you very broad, and the, the broadness actually does help, because for, for her, it means she can interact with our designers, our tech teams, our marketing teams. Like across the spectrum, she knows that she can go in and add value and is seen as a leader across because she's deep in her space, so people see her as an expert, but she has that kind of broad applicability that she's, you know, she's dangerous across verticals, which is important. So you want to you wanna be that T. So I think both being able to be a leader, but also understanding kind of what your T looks like, right? Where you're deep and where you're broad. Yeah. What, great upgrade. By the way, if you were in my class, you get an A+. Plus. That, <laughs> that message, you know why that comment is especially helpful? Is that extrapolates across almost every industry and company. This isn't just Amazon. It isn't just healthcare, et cetera. But how you get the power of the team. Um, very, very well said. Laura, let me just say a massive thank you. I can't think of a better kickoff, keynote, um, insight on technology, on healthcare, and how you do this balancing act between growth and ensuring society is, is well served. Thank you very much. Hope we can have you back. Again. It was a blast. Thanks, everybody.